this computer. Okay. So Adolf Loss, 1870, 1933, uh, a very important architect, as you know. I like this quotation from him. Be not afraid of being called unfashionable. It is true. Uh, he, he was against the current. He was he was a, a great polemicist, and I think he defended his uh, position uh, quite uh, strongly, maybe sometimes too strongly, maybe. But uh, anyway, we'll uh, we'll arrive at more details as we move move along. I do not draw plans, facades, or sections. That's what he says. In other words, he he conceived of buildings as, as holes, as they should be. But uh, we still need the plans, the facades, and the sections. And I imagine he did draw them, uh, whatever he said. But as an Italian critic told me, Luigi Prestinenza, uh, <laughs> he told me once, then never listen to architects. They say one thing and they do another thing. Sometimes it is true. So this is the man, a uh, very vertical man, but troubled. And he even had uh, health problems, elegant otherwise, and, uh, and sitting in that uh, armchair quite, uh, you know, uh, impressively. But you see here, I mean, in this detail, he has in his uh, hand in fact, he seems to have in both hands. Now, it's, it's the same object. It's a hearing device because he didn't uh, he didn't hear well at all, and um, he was almost deaf. And even maybe the expression of his face says something about um, you know a suffering, a deeply felt suffering. But the deeply felt suffering didn't make him uh, modest. And that is uh, something on one hand, uh, well, is is rather problematic when when uh, that immodesty becomes, um, uh, you know, uh, bothering, bothering for other people, uh, including himself, because uh, you know a man of his stature in the field of culture to be sent to court and, and be sentenced because of, of the misery of some, some happenings that he couldn't abstain himself from. Anyway, otherwise very elegant and I would say uh, handsome. He loved women and women loved him, but it, it seems he abused them. And he had several wives. Uh, hello, Mr. Loss, happy birthday to you. Some drawings and sketches. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, he did say that he doesn't draw uh, plans, uh, sections, facades, but it's uh, only uh, uh, in part true. After all, what do we see here? <laughs> you know, but what he meant, you understood, he meant that he 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 tried to to perceive or understand the building in its uh, wholeness. Uh, so uh, he tried to avoid the bidimensional, but you know, the three-dimensional uh, uh, is supported by the two-dimensional uh, uh, entities. After all, Palladio, the great Andrea Palladio, when you look at his drawings, they, he never used perspectives. He only used Euclidean uh, drawings, plans, sections, facades, usually half a section, half a facade. Anyway, um, so these are some sketches by uh, by Adolf Loss. And um, I don't know, sketches, many architects sketch, he sketched too, but he also transformed these sketches quite often in buildings, into buildings. But he was a troubled man, and I think even that seminal essay, Crime and Ornament, or Ornament and Crime, I always forget which comes first. Uh, maybe Ornament and Crime uh, is, the, is the, the, the title. 
uh, shows it. What is strange about Adolf Loss or about me is that when I read that essay, I had a feeling that I was hearing him. I mean, not not only that I read what I what what he wrote, but I, in a strange way, I I, I felt as if I've heard his voice while I was reading his text. Anyway, these are some sketches for the Chicago Tribune competition where he proposed a giant uh, Doric uh, column, which was in fact the, the, the tower itself will arrive there. Um, there is a Villa Müller and a Villa Müller. You'll see both. He also built a house for in Paris for uh, the well-known uh, Romanian uh, poet uh, the, one of the founders of the Dada movement, uh, Tristan Zara, whose name Tristan Zara is derived from Trist in, in, in Zara. But he played a little bit with the letters, so with the words, so it became Tristan Zara. But, but initially, the, this was the meaning, Trist in Zara. So the Cafe Museum on the Karlsplatz Square, this is a work that still exists. And, uh, you know, outside is maybe nothing exceptional. Inside it is kept as it was built, you know, uh, more than 100 years ago. And it still functions. It's not a very innovative interior. He did a lot of interiors, actually. Uh, and uh, I don't illustrate a lot here, but he did a lot of interiors. In other words, he worked as an interior designer, as a, an architect of interiors for uh, for a good number of years. And by the way of this, uh, I, I, I say it again that uh, Carlos Carpa, the great Carlos Carpa, taught at the University of Venice interior architecture. That is not I mean, interior architecture is still architecture, very much so, but it is differentiated usually in schools of architecture from what is usually called architecture, although it shouldn't be. Anyway, uh, with Carlos Carpa, this happened because he didn't have a diploma uh, in architecture. So he was accepted, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as, a, as a professor there but uh, only at the faculty of the interior. Anyway, we arrive at uh, in Vienna, back to Vienna, back to the building, uh, you know, designed at the inside of the interior by, by, uh, by Adolf Loss. Now, Villa Karma in Montreux is quite a large building uh, and uh, you'll see it, very thick walls, uh, the interior uh, and uh, and then it's kind of interesting that, that you know you could almost say well actually the house is this but there is this uh, it appears as a, almost like an afterthought or, or you know a second skin and the second uh, space around the, the core that is uh, you know uh, with the exception of, of this uh, functions here and you know the corners is it's almost like a surrounding veranda but it's actually happening only on two sides with a very impressive entrance into the building uh, through or in between uh, four powerful columns you'll see the it's a large building uh, it's it's interesting you know it's it's um, i mean look particularly at this plan here Usually the corner is the, the, the sensitive part of the building from many points of view, you know, if even physically is the most vulnerable place of the building because it's hit by the elements and by time more severely at, at the corner. And here exactly at the corner, he creates those uh, additional spaces that are somehow uh, you know, different from what is happening within the core itself. So this is the building. And I, I, I still think that this uh, kind of open space around the core building uh, adds some specificity uh, 
of the, to the building. It's an impressive villa, uh, you know, by any standards. Um, you know, a, a rich, powerful building, uh, certainly not for proletarians. It's also near the lake, so it's not just uh, the building itself, but also the, the, the proximity to the lake makes it uh, additionally uh, significant and uh, impressive. This interest also is intriguing, you know, you, you enter into the building through uh, an approximation of the Doric uh, order, and uh, so the, 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 the temple-like uh, facade enters into some kind of a dialogue with the domesticity of a, of a house, because it is a house. But because of this interest, there is a certain ambiguity. It's, it's, the house becomes at least in part a temple, and the temple becomes you know, domesticated because it is a villa. So the villa temple, the temple villa, it's a hybrid uh, um, conjunction here between two perceptions, two architectures, two functions. Essentially, it's just one, it's a house. But architecturally, he plays with um, meanings that go beyond um, and he does it intentionally. Of course, uh, columns had been used in domestic, uh, domestic architectures many times, but he does it in a primeval way, archaic way, atavistic way. And even inside, the man who wrote violently against the ornament has no problem at all to use marble that is quite, quite ornamented, and you'll see it in other works. So, you know, was he really so much against the ornament? We know what kind of ornament he was against, but, but we see that he didn't actually advocate a, a white architecture, completely devoid of the capriciousness of forms that uh, ornaments are usually associated with. Not to speak here also in this case about the ornamental effects of the library itself, because the books cover the walls. And in this case, rather, you know, uh, predictably and rigidly, almost all the books are kind of uh, similar, you know, here and also here. But still, it's a vibration added to the wall, which does have um, a certain ornamental uh, quality. Uh, all in all, this is not an interior of someone who is totally against uh, ornament. Look at the rug. Now, I don't know if the rug was brought in by him, but all in all, the building is not, uh, is not um, saying no to, to what, in a larger sense, the word ornament might mean. Here, the library is uh, explicitly I mean, it's sufficiently disordered to create a, some kind of a modernistic uh, ornamental fascia for the walls. It, it is a fine building and, uh, you know, it is opulent. It is, uh, uh, it has a betrayed symmetry. Uh, it, it emphasizes the corners first as fortresses as towers of power, and then at the top, they become um, uh, more, uh, they, 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 uh, they are courageous enough at the top to show the intrinsic uh, uh, vulnerability, if I can call it so here, you know, all the parts. So he, he, he was a very interesting architect. Now look at the interest here. Again, would you say that this is the man who wrote violently against ornament? What are these? They are certainly ornaments, but they are ornaments provoked by nature, but still ornaments. Of course, when you do something like this and you use marbles, you marble, you don't need other ornaments at all. They, they, they are sufficient.
in, in that essay, uh, Ornament and Crime, he advocated this uh, or proposed this, this idea that the more civilized a society, the more it renounces ornament. And the more civilized a society, the more advanced, the more, uh, the less graffitis, the less tattoos, which is not true at all. In Vienna, there are plenty of tattoo shops. People do tattoo them themselves, and, and there are also uh, plenty of graffitis. Uh, I, I, I once documented this for myself. So he was a strange man, but he, he, he was right in a way, uh, of course, because the ornaments of the 19th century probably became suffocating. So there was a need for some kind of a revolution to bring in the freshness of, of modernism. And he was one of the apostles of that uh, uh, modernistic uh, uh, outlook on life and architecture and everything. Look at this, you know, uh, look, at the, look at the floor. Uh, is it not ornamental? Of course it is ornamental. Um, here again. But all in all, he, he was able to have a certain uh, coherence and the, the, the persistence within that coherence that, that made his work have a, a strong impact. He loved the Doric, uh, but where is the base of the column? There is no base, they just spring from the, from the slab here uh, towards the top. An, an interesting deviation, you, you, you would not call his buildings his building, this building, or even other, other buildings as being postmodern, although they might appear so because of the, of the borrowings from the history of architecture. But these bo borrowings are somehow, uh, um, th th there is something genuine about it, so they are not really uh, stage design. This, uh, I don't understand very well what is going on, but this, this door seemed to be wider than a normal door. And uh, so imagine closing one door, there is no room for the other one. I don't know, uh, could it be that the perspective is forced and they appear to be wider than they actually are? The width of this door should be half of this opening, but seems they seem to be wider anyway um it was for sale this building recently but i don't think the price was uh, <laughs> you know um, sufficiently low to um, make us entertain uh, certain dreams the american bar in Vienna from 1904. So he was uh, 34 years old, um, <laughs> quite busy, quite ornamental. Some of these uh, images um, do not uh, belong to him necessarily. They, they, maybe they were added to the walls because of the owners of the place, or I don't know. Uh, look at the ceiling, it's ornamental. Look at the floor, it is ornamental. Um, look at the facade. It's it's more than ornamental. It's uh, hyper or super uh, ornamental. Anyway, he loved America. He traveled to America young. What I mean by America, I mean North America, the, the one which inappropriately calls itself North uh, America. America, first there are two Americas and there are a number of countries in the Americas. But when we say America, we mean the United States. It's not quite correct, I think, towards the other, the other states. I mean, even here it says American bar. What does it mean? I mean, we, we do see the, the flag, uh, but uh, it's the North American bar. And even in North America, the, there is also Canada. And anyway, 
the approximations of language from 1910. So he was 40, the Steiner House in Vienna. It's not a very large building. Uh, I visited it with the students from the university here, but we couldn't get in. It's some kind of a embassy or a, a private owner. It's very difficult to get in. We were unable to. In section, you see, it appears to be more ample than, than, than in the facade. You see here only a building with a, you know, an attic and one floor, but uh, from the side, and then you look at the section, is a different story. So um, this is one, I would almost say, typical Adolf Loss uh, building. Uh, when I say typical, he didn't really repeat himself, but there are certain traits that make the, the, the Adolf Loss uh, positioning himself within architecture uh, distinctive. Uh, for example, this uh, curved roof, he used it in a, at least in another building and you are going to see it. Then you have this uh, facade, which is almost like a human face in a way you know, with two eyes and a nose, a mouth. Uh, there is something of a human face, at least on one facade of the building. He fought he was a complex man. When you read, I only read that, that I wrote, a, I read a few other things, but mainly that, that essay, very important essay, Ornament and Crime. And you say that this was a man fighting with tradition, but it's not true. Look at the ceiling here. You know, the, the, there are many buildings all over the world, especially in rural areas, having this kind of, uh, with exposed uh, wooden, uh, beams and so on. Uh, this is not modern aesthetics. It's, it's very much very explicitly connected with, with the past, with a certain tradition. He was also a man in this essay, uh, he wrote about the aristocrat who is a, an atheist, but, but he's also an aristocrat. So the atheist aristocrat passing by a church and taking off his hat. And, and he did this himself towards tradition. He takes off his hat, meaning there is respect and there is reverence even, uh, there is affection, there is recognition, although essentially is considered a, a modern architect. And he was, but his relationship, I mean, there is something schismatic, which is maybe a specific to, to the culture of, uh, of, of Vienna and maybe, you know, uh, to the culture of, uh, of Austria. It's not an accident that uh, Sigmund Freud uh, functioned there, that psychoanalysis was born in Vienna. Um, it's a very interesting culture and a very interesting city. Uh, there are contradictions, there are conflicts. So this is the, the Steiner house. Vienna has several buildings by him. Uh, and uh, in this respect is, uh, is very rich. But of course, Vienna is very rich period not just because of the lost buildings, but it, it does have a number of buildings. So you are going to see probably all of them. Lost House. This is the famous Goldman and Salach building overlooking Michaelers Platz in Vienna, a mixed use building known colloquially as the Lost House. Um, so here it is. Uh, again, at the base, is not saying no to, to ornament because of the richness of the material he uses 
that is marble. From here upwards, yes. But from here below, in fact, it's more ornamented than, than what we see on the left and on the right, all the existing buildings. He was a fighter. He fought. He fought for his idea, ideas vehemently. Uh, he, he was a great polemicist. And because he was a great polemicist, I, pol I, I became a polemicist myself vis-a-vis -vis himself by launching, vis-a-vis -vis him, by launching today a competition for a new ornament by the way of his 150th birthday. And I even stated there that uh, I expected some kind of, uh, um, you know, if he was alive, some kind of uh, irritation. Anyway, um, we move on. This is the plan of the of the lost house, and uh, it's a very fine, uh, very fine plan. It's very well drawn. It has uh, clarity. It has uh, complexity. It's both simple and complex. And uh, again, <laughs> the lack of ornaments uh, that he's so famous for. Um, full of uh, contradictions, this gentleman. A view from the interior, uh, several views from the interior. A rich building, uh, actually, it's not. Uh, he didn't work for uh, for the proletarians, really. This is a cartoon that uh, makes fun of his building. You know the resemblance between uh, that uh, opening in the in the pavement of the of the street and the facade of his building. There was maliciousness. There was. Um, uh, there is always like this. When you try to bring in something new, you you encounter uh, resistance, and uh, the effect um, could be problematic. Okay. Now we look at uh, another house by him. Uh, this one I, I, I visited. I saw. Uh, I mentioned that there is a certain uh, aspect. There are certain aspects of his buildings that uh, can be encountered in, uh, in in several buildings. You see the the, the curved um, um, attic, um, and uh, you recognize it as. A, in fact, I, when I I came across this building accidentally without knowing where it, that it was there. I was with some students and I told them this seems to be an Adolf Loos building. And then we checked it out on the web and we, we discovered that indeed it is a, it was an Adolf Loos building. That we came across accidentally. Okay, so um, the Schell house in Vienna from 1913 uh, is uh, is um, you know the the the, the typical uh, um, house by uh, by the by Adolf Loos, which has a side that is uh, very modernistic and cubistic and so-called clean, and on the other hand, there is some kind of a, um, a reference to a certain past. You see the stepped building here. Um, this is a clearly modern architecture, but there is something within, and without the help of the of the of the ivy, there is something in the building. Although, if we look at the at the, at the windows, this kind of uh, window at, or or you know glassed part at the top of the window uh, is is rather traditional in modern architecture. This was usually avoided. 
Uh, this adds an, uh, a certain charm to his buildings that you have a modernistic uh, uh, aesthetics, but also aesthetic, but you also have some kind of um, uh, referencing to, to, to a certain past. These dualities are, are present in the Viennese culture in many ways, all kinds of contradictions, all kinds of dualities. He has rooms, but he also has a certain continuity of space. So there is an ambiguity in his architecture, always. That's why his architecture is simple, but not simplistic. And it's simple only partially. Another villa uh, remodel, in this case, he, he, we don't see much here, but, but we do see that the man who uh, almost screamed against the ornament uh, was not at all uh, uh, without uh, being seduced by ornament. Not was the outside so much, but at the inside. Again, this was a remodeling of an existing house. A mausoleum for Max Borjak, the, the great uh, composer, which was not built. Uh, it was built more re uh, recently in some kind of uh, uh, in, in the memory, in, in, me in memory, in a way of this building, but he didn't build it. He didn't build this mausoleum for Max Borjak. You see it here as a model. And uh, some drawings. I don't know if he did these drawings, but it's a very simple cubical mausoleum, one little room. And then Sam Jacob erects the Adolf Loss design mausoleum in Highgate uh, Cemetery. You see it here but much later, meaning recently. It's not really what, what I mean, look at the materiality. That's not what uh, Adolf Loss had in mind, but the reference is uh, explicit enough. The Ruffer House from 1922. He does work often with a square plan, and then you have within the square plan various rooms, you know, in a, in a rather traditional way uh, designed, but also there is, especially in, a, in relation to the larger spaces, a certain continuity of space. Otherwise, the building is uh, maybe unexceptional, you know, you look at it and uh, you say, well, is this building really by Adolf Loss? It is by Adolf Loss, but uh, it's not really a, a great building, this particular one. Anyway, interesting here in this drawing is the positioning of the openings, the windows. Uh, do they follow a certain script, a certain uh, uh, you know program, so to speak? Are they? Uh, uh, they seem to to be placed uh, um, capriciously as opposed to Le Corbusier who worked with the modular and had all kinds of calculations behind his aesthetics. Here, the appearance is that uh, they are rather capriciously placed. Interesting uh, drawing here, you know, and, and it is, it is, uh, it is a suggestion for a possible way or strategy of designing buildings in this way. You just very simply design the facades, although he said that he doesn't design facades or doesn't draw facades, but that's what we see here, just facades. And then the openings to be just uh, black rectangles or squares or whatever they are. And then you do see the, the, the conflict, the tension, the, the duality wall, opening in the wall, wall, opening in the wall. Uh, it's, uh, there is, maybe this is a fundamental, um, uh, how to say, uh, dialogue, uh, often conflictual between the wall and the window and the doors.
he had a very strict way of of of, uh, of, uh, of uh, pro pre making pronouncements, not just through words, but also through through, through his buildings. They are pronouncements. They are in, in that way they are radical. Uh, how would the building be if it was a pronouncement? You know, something that was. Uh, you know, uh, exposed or, or externalized from a tribune, some kind of a manifesto. Although the manifesto was actually defending the bourgeois life, these villas are not for revolutionaries. They are, in fact, for well-to-do people of the upper class, bourgeois, noblemen, and so on. He, even the house he designed for the uh, uh, the poet uh, Tristan Sara, which was supposed to be a house for one of the founders of the Dada movement, there is nothing Dada about that building. It's true, it was built by Adolf Loos, but uh, still, the the owner of the house was a, a Dada poet. Now we arrive, we were talking about Maison Tsara, Tristan Tsara, Tristin Tsara, um, uh, the very important uh, presence in the culture of the 20th century. He even wrote the manifesto, one of the manifestos of Dadaism. Dadaism. And it's very interesting that um, Tsara commissioned uh, Adolf Loos. He could have commissioned his compatriot, Marcel Yanko, Marcel Yanko, who, who was actually uh, himself a founder of the Dada movement, was an architect. He built a good number of villas, so he knew how to build houses. But Tristan Tsara commissioned Aldo Adolf Loos. I always ask myself, how come that Tristan Tsara, a man born in a village in Moldavia, had the money to build a, 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 a big house in the center of Paris. Well, I, what I learned is that it, it wasn't actually his money. It was the money of his wife, who was Swedish. And um, you know, she allowed him to invest in the house, trusting Adolf Loss. And I, I don't think it is a loss, actually. It's a good building. It would have been perhaps better if uh, the parapet here was higher as it was supposed to be, uh, it was designed, you will see, uh, I think, later that his original design, uh, this line was, you know, like at least one meter higher, or maybe one meter and a half. For some reasons, it, it stopped here. Otherwise, the building is as he designed it. It's symmetrical. It's symmetrical. But, and, and, and there is duality. There are two entrances. There are, there are it's a very interesting building. And the dualities are also expressed by the fact that he uses different materials on this portion of the facade, facade as opposed to uh, what is above. This is giant. You know, imagine here if this was about 90 centimeters or whatever, a human being probably having the head somewhere here. It's, it's very tall, this opening, and it's... Um, somehow connected with an authority that you'd, you wouldn't expect a, a mere poet to have. Of course, the mere poet in this case was a major poet and a, a poet who provoked a lot of uh, um, scandals in a way in culture, being part of the Dada movement. The interior, on the other hand, has nothing to do with Dada. The Dada poet lived quite comfortably in an opulent, almost traditional looking house. You look at the furniture, you know, you would expect a Dada poet to have a bench with three legs, not four. No, certainly not four. And you expect the table to have a rift or something or itself to have just one leg or uh, instabilities, but there is nothing unstable here except a certain fluidity of space that uh, loss was quite good at uh, obtaining. So you see the paradoxes in culture. The Dada 
revolutionary lift in quite a non-revolutionary way, with the exception, of course, that his building was designed by uh, uh, Adolf Loos. Some pictures in, in colors. But they're all gone. Tristan Sara died. Adolf Loos died. The wife of Tristan Sara died. Maybe even the people who moved in after them died as well, and maybe without maybe. So this is how life is. The building persists, it's still there um, in Montmartre. Tristan Sara House. Again, interesting choice for, for, for Tristan Sara to commission Adolf Loss. That's, these are original drawings with a lot of frenzied calculations around the plans. This is what he proposed, different from what it was built. It was built, uh, you know, but it's okay, I guess. At least the trees now uh, by themselves add that extra height that, that actually the building doesn't have. The building seems to be bigger here than in reality. When I arrived there, I was not so impressed for some reason. The Muller Villa uh, from 1926. So again, there is a Muller Villa in Vienna and there is the Muller Villa in Prague. Here again, we have the, the paradigmatic um, human face on the facade of the building, the cube with a human face. Maybe we could describe his buildings in this way, the cube with a human face. There is a building by Le Corbusier in Paris that is very similar to this one and you are going to see it. And they were made around the same time. It's hard to tell who, I don't know, maybe they just did, it, did them uh, independently, but they are very similar. This is what he is very good at, to incorporate, uh, to have uh, additional spaces where he places uh, pieces of furniture that are part of the, of the architecture in a way and have a certain fluidity of the space. Not fluidity in the sense of Zaha Hadid, but we are talking here about a certain degree of freedom within the cube. A certain continuity of space, but contained that, that continuity of space within the cube or a cube-like structure. Now you will see Le Corbusier and Pierre Gendret, the Maison Planex, in Paris versus Adolf Loss Villa Muller. And here they are. This is uh, Villa Muller in Vienna. And on the left of the diagonal, uh, Villa Plane X uh, of, um, of Le Corbusier and Pierre Genre. Now, a house not built in Paris for the American entertainer Josephine Baker, a woman who broke the heart or uh, 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 fired the heart, not just of Adolf Loos, but also Le Corbusier. In fact, uh, Adolf Loos was so uh, seduced by Josephine Baker that he offered to draw for her the plans of a house in Paris without any commission, without any fee. Now, of course, if you look at the picture, you kind of understand uh, the, the weakness of Adolf Loss. And as I said, he was not the only weak one. Le Corbusier also fell in front of the charms of this lady who was a great dancer and entertainer. She didn't build this villa. It was the, the voice of her. Pardon? I guess it was the voice of Josephine Baker that... <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Men, no, men are not seduced just by the voice, uh, Diana. Thank you for the intervention. Uh, she wasn't just a voice. 
No, she was beautiful as well, but I, I guess the voice was like a siren, <laughs> you know, like a mermaid. Well, uh, she was a seducer and she knew, seduced uh, large audiences. Uh, uh, she she uh, had an immense success. Uh, in the end, she bu bought a, a, a castle. She didn't build a little villa, which is not so little by uh, Adolf Loss. She, she settled for a castle uh, to make things clear. But there is a swimming pool within this house. And here there are some views uh, generated today uh, with digital uh, technologies. Uh, that, that would have been the, uh, Josephine Baker's villa in, in, in Paris, uh, built by um, Adolf Loss, who was not a man to be indifferent to the feminine beauty. And you see in the plan, the, the, the swimming pool here. And I imagine that Adolf Loos imagined himself standing here, you know, and watching uh, the woman uh, with a great voice uh, swim and so on. Uh, otherwise, there are reminiscences of, of, of a building that we already saw in Switzerland with a rounded uh, corner. Uh, here is just one. And uh, a large building, you know, for a single uh, person. But this single person was Josephine Baker, who has uh, had tremendous success in Paris. And um, her dancing uh, brought large audiences wherever she went. Law. Here was the, the encased. Um, the swimming pool and uh, as I said maybe the architect would just sit here on a chair and, and watch the fish uh, swim. An extravagant uh, proposal um, which could have been built of course but uh, as I said Josephine Baker settled for a castle. On the other hand, Le Corbusier, the other admirer, there are pictures, I don't know if I have them here with, with, with both of them, Le Corbusier and uh, Josephine Baker on a, on a ship, either bringing them to the United States or bringing them from the United States to Europe. Uh, I think Le Corbusier fell in love with her just as um, Adolf Loos fell in love with her. So this is the, you know, the the room of the of of the of the swimming, and um, yeah, I hope I have other pictures with this. Uh, this doesn't really look like Adolf Loos from behind. Adolf Loos has a different had a different taste in uh, in clothing, I think, but he does look Austrian somehow. Um, descending from the mountains of Austria into the city of lights. So the Josephine Baker Villa that was never built, but you have now the chance to recognize uh, the unrecognizable Le Corbusier dressed for the uh, carnival. And here is uh, Josephine Baker. They are both uh, in, a, in a playing mood. And I don't know who is this one. Uh, Adolf Ross was not here. But uh, as you can see, um, Le Corbusier was uh, himself uh, uh, flying high, so to speak, because that's what love uh, makes uh, does, to, does to people. He became a, a teenage like and, uh, <laughs> and Josephine Baker uh, assumed the role uh, of a companion in the same way. Here they are. Four men, uh, the architect uh, Le, Le Corbusier is recognizable uh, easily, not just because of his uh, figure, uh, but also he was actually frail and it's strange. He has uh, white shoes or, you know, almost white. Um, I should know something about this because my mother used to dress me up when I was very little with white shoes. And uh, it was impossible to play soccer uh, or football with white shoes. Now, I'm not saying that Le Corbusier was playing soccer, certainly not on this ship. On the other hand, the Josephine Baker is smiling because uh, she's entertained by the solemn man on the right and by the 
they always inspired uh, Le Corbusier, and I don't know who is the, the one on the left. Anyway, Villa Müller in Prague, 1928, the Czech Republic, a typical, if we can say so, Adolf Loss building, powerful geometrical, cube-like, with uh, penetrations into the wall that uh, state clearly this is an Adolf Loss uh, building. We are not going to uh, submit to the rigors of uh, predictability. We can place windows wherever we want, but we prefer at least towards, one st towards the street to have something resembling a little bit of human face. I don't know if he did it consciously, but uh, there is a motif that repeats itself. Uh, this would have been perfectly symmetrical if this second window was not there. If you remove this, remove this second window here, I, um, I, I, I could equally call it the first window here <laughs> instead of the second, then you get a, a, perfect, uh, a perfect symmetry and uh, kind of a face. The interior is, what can we say? The revolutionary uh, proposed uh, conventional bourgeois, well, not totally, because look here, there is communication between floors. And um, this is important. It, it, it makes this space much more than just a room with a door. He was able, uh, Adolf Loss in his architecture, to unite something of what we call tradition uh, with um, new uh, so-called visions, modern visions. Look at this, you know, this, uh, this, uh, this corner here. You know, who would do something like this? You know? I mean, it would have been very easy to just make it like here and just extend this desk or whatever it is, a cabinet or something. Why did he do this? Well, we, we cannot answer all, uh, all questions. Uh, it's a big house, that's for sure. Uh, these are some, in, con, con, well, more recent Italian drawings of this famous, uh, famous building. With, uh, with a lot of wood, um, at that time, I guess, um, there wasn't any scare related to having not enough oxygen in, in the world. Um, not that today there is uh, too much concern either, although we talk all the time about sustainability, ecology, pollution. But the truth of the matter is we keep producing a lot of paper and abusing the, the forests and we, we keep ignoring uh, the high levels of pollution. As long as we run, run, run in our cars. The ornaments that he fought against, right in the foreground, but, but there are great qualities here, architectural qualities, when you look, it's truly uh, very well orchestrated, this, this connection between the first floor and what follows above. Another uh, villa from 1929, but I'm not sure, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it was initially a villa, but then it became a country house, kind of a, like a hostel uh, in the mountains. Uh, a, a, public building, at least to an extent. And uh, this one is more, I would say, banal, because this is, is um, you wouldn't even say this is a building by Adolf Loss, but it is. Maybe the, uh, the, uh, the interior is a different story, but not at the exterior. Uh, it's also possible that there were, there were other interventions there, or he, he had to reconfigure an existing building, I don't know. But it is by him. On the other hand, at the interior, as we can see here, there is something of the, of the spatial uh, interest of Adolf Loss. This uh, enclosing pieces of furniture, making them uh, part of the, of the architecture. Uh, it's, it's, it's typical of him. It's also typical of uh, traditional Japan, old houses in Japan, not such uh, copious uh, 
king size beds, but but uh, narrow twin size beds are often uh, enclosed in traditional Japanese architecture, and is actually quite an interesting idea. In this way, you don't have a, a, a bed in the middle of the of the room. The room is left free, and you just have an alcove where you sleep. It's fine. It works. And that alcove could also be used sometimes when no one sleeps there for storage and so on. I think the suggestions of the Japanese uh, uh, traditional house uh, are, are valid. Another villa uh, in Prague, um, very well kept, as you can see, and the tree is very happy. Um, would be nice probably to, to live in a building by Adolf Law, surrounded by these trees or in the proximity of these trees. Large space, lots of bulbs at the top, no problem with providing electrical energy to them. And uh, the, uh, the windows are as they are. They, they, they do, they do um, communicate that the architect didn't divorce himself totally from the culture of the region. There is, on the other hand, a certain monumentality of, of the furniture he uses. The, the, you see this opulent uh, flowing of, 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 of the furniture parts of the, of, of the house. Now, it's, it's kind of ironic that most of the buildings that he built, this, this man who became notorious also because of his uh, fighting uh, hard against ornament. M many of his buildings, domestic buildings, uh, and that's what he mainly built, uh, have uh, great Persian rugs, which are the ultimate ornaments, actually. You know, a Persian rug uh, <laughs> cannot be conceived in the absence of uh, ornaments. And you saw in other buildings as well, and in this one, two uh, great uh, rugs, quite ornamental, adorning um, the house. So there, so much for not having ornaments. The stair is nice, a little bit uh, psychedelic, uh, but not a lot. Anyway, um, moving forward. This is a drawing done more recently because those, um, well, someone used templates or um, I think templates, yes. But I, I like this, this uh, transition from one floor to a next that is very close, you know, just a few steps and like an, in, this is kind of orchestrating the building on the basis of, of uh, in intermediary space, spaces. And always in architecture, I think when you have interstitial spaces or intermediary spaces or in between spaces, important architects love in betweenness. And we see examples of in betweenness here as well. Uh, what else is, is what is happening here is some kind of a in-betweenness on on the way towards other rooms and other spaces of the house you you go through a space that is intermediate in between now the furniture i'm sure was not uh, the one well who knows <laughs> no it looks like a more modern uh, furniture The Chicago Tribune Tower, this was a significant project he did, and I keep saying to the, the, the vast majority of students who attend my, my, uh, uh, my presentations, that this was a very important project and that I tell them that they could manifest themselves also at the level of a project. If the project is significantly done, it has something to say, even if it remains just on paper, it contributes to the culture of architecture, sometimes significantly. And this is such a, such a work. It was not built. Chicago preferred the neo-Gothic building, uh, but his work is whimsical, it's strange, it's powerful, 
it has many attributes. Uh, what we see at the bottom is almost the mausoleum for Max Dvorak, but at a larger scale. Then we have a Gothic, uh, uh, Doric uh, column, wider column. Uh, I read that this was a reference to the columns in a newspaper because this was destined to be the headquarters, the building of Chicago Tribune, which was a newspaper. But I think somehow there is more to it. This could be an explanation, but would, would it be the only one? One thing is for sure, his contribution and the way some very important architects who sent works for this competition, um, his work stands out still. Here is a, a rendering, uh, modeling of, 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 the, of the present of the, of the project that he did. Um, so this was uh, his entry for this competition. And here you see others. This was uh, Walter Gropius. I forgot who did this one. Uh, this one was, uh, I don't know, Bruno Taut or Angst Hartung. So this was Adolf Loss. And it does stand out because, again, he assumed a dialogue with the past. I mean, anyone would recognize a Doric column. And this is a Doric column, but it's a Doric column which supports the sky itself. This could also be seen like a metaphor for what the media became. The media became increasingly more powerful, increasingly powerful and, uh, and uh, you know, imagining that the media supports the sky, maybe it's not such a, an exaggeration for human affairs. This is the plan. Look at this plan. I mean, if a student would do something like this, you know, just you know, just uh, three elevators and some doors, and then here written pipes. That's all that's written here, pipes. Uh, I mean, it's funny, no? We are talking about one of the major architects of, of modernism of, of the 20th century. But the plan is, uh, you know, uh, so simple and almost simplistic and almost infantile. Here is a different thing, uh, it's true, but uh, what we see here is, is literally a, a grown-up man playing, uh, 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 being an architect uh, in a rather unconvincing way. Although this, I'm not trying to say that the proposal doesn't have uh, meaning and force, it does, but it is uh, it is a little bit, I mean, there is always naivete, I think, in some major, major architectures. Now, of course, what we see on the left is, uh, is the modern, the contemporary contribution, elaborated drawings and so on. The vision belongs to the drawing on the right. There was the vision. On the left, we have the expertise of the specialist you know, the technician who can uh, draw and uh, uh, unbelievable things uh, using, I don't know what software, but the vision is on the right. The Dory column, the great Dory column. Now, just like in Moscow, where the, for the palace of the Soviets, uh, uh, Stalin and the so-called people chose um, so-called classical building and not uh, the, the fantasies of Le Corbusier and other modern architects. Here in Chicago, forgetting uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and forgetting Louis Sullivan, uh, Chicagoans uh, chose, or the owner of uh, the Chicago Tribune, this design, which is a neo-Gothic building, and it was built. Uh, so it was not built uh, the extravagant proposal of uh, Adolf Loss or uh, other proposals by other very important architects, but instead uh, the um, neo-Gothic uh, tower. You see here, it, it was designed by Raymond Hood, uh, who also built in New York, and I don't know who John uh, Maddy was, but uh, Raymond Hood was a known architect. 
but uh, known architect with nostalgias for an architecture that was probably uh, under the influence of uh, the, the 19th century, if not earlier. Müller Villa in Prague, um, we saw already some uh, images. I don't know why I showed them again here. I have to uh, clean up a little bit this presentation, sorry. Um, we saw this building already. Maybe not all these slides, not all these images, but we saw. So uh, this is what Adolf Loos wrote. My architecture is not conceived by drawings, but by spaces. I do not draw plans, facades, or sections. For me, the ground floor, first floor, do not exist. There are only interconnected continual spaces, rooms, halls, terraces. Each space needs a different height. These spaces are connected so that ascent and descent are not only unnoticeable, but at the same time functional. Short had the record of a conversation in Pearson in 1930. He was to die um, less than three years later. Some furniture by him. Um, he designed a lot of furniture and I think he was very uh, convincing as a furniture designer. Good materials, noble woods, great craftsmanship. But I would still say that um, the connection with a certain tradition and with a certain culture of craftsmanship is obvious. Uh, also, the revolutionary loved comfort. He didn't build for proletarians, as I said. He built for, uh, you know, rather well-to-do people. I'm, I don't even want to imagine how much such a piece of furniture would cost today. Even this chair, look how it is crafted. It is crafted beautifully. Uh, and uh, without uh, parametric design or scripting and programming, look, look at these uh, fluidities here. This was all done... Uh, manually it seems like a comfortable chair it's 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 well designed this one is strange because it's it's you know the sitting takes place diagonally um, yeah it's a strange uh, chair this one this one also it's whimsical uh, especially in the back he had a whimsical side, Adolf Loos, no doubt. And he didn't seem to be obsessively concerned with comfort. Uh, that back uh, of the chair doesn't seem to me uh, excessively comfortable, no. Maybe excessively uncomfortable, but not comfortable. Another solid chair by uh, Adolf Loos, a chair that would say, you can sit on me forever, I will not betray you, I will be loyal to you. Uh, and um, the legs do have a certain clan day towards uh, maybe even the Egyptian uh, culture. Uh, there are all kinds of influences. <laughs> no, this table does have an excess of legs, doesn't it? I mean, why, why does it need seven legs, maybe eight, maybe there is another leg hidden by the one uh, most advanced here. Seven or eight legs is a lot for a, such a little table. So he protested against ornament, but these legs are certainly not all of them structural. He could have done quite well with four legs. He didn't need eight legs. That is ornament. Uh, that's the ornament. When you capriciously amplify a certain number of elements uh, which are not really needed, uh, structurally speaking. I like these pieces. Uh, they are cubistic, they are, but, but there is also a certain sensitivity that goes beyond a simplistic um, um, understanding of what uh, cubism might mean. Even this one is fine. You know, the, the, it's solid wood. It's it's it, it's it's a it's it has dignity. <laughs> Maybe too much dignity for its function. I don't know. What would you put inside to deserve so, so much dignity? It's a question. 
it's a fine piece of furniture, it's true. Uh, if you have this, this piece of furniture in your room, you don't need anything else. In fact, you could even sleep within, you can read within, uh, you can do a lot of things within and not need anything else. Dan, can I interrupt? No. <laughs> okay. No, no, please, please. I uh, know yeah, you, if you, you, if you go back, if you go back to this wardrobe. You always uh, do this to, to ask me to go back, please. Uh, uh, these, uh, uh, this wardrobe is before the new hinges were invented. Uh, this is with the old hinges. So you see these vertical uh, borders. Uh, nowadays, we have the different kind of hinges which don't uh, show the borders of the box. Uh, so this, this is where you see the hinges also. Uh, so I, that was what I wanted to add. Some, some people had derived a way uh, where they overlap the shutter with this border. So you don't see these vertical and horizontal borders. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Vatsar, how, how do you prefer it? With, uh, with them uh, exposed or not? The hinges? No, no, no. Without uh, them being exposed because then you see a clear box with just four divisions. Uh, this you see the, the border of the box and you see the hinges also here. But I actually like to see the hinges and, and um, <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, many years ago I saw a portfolio by Stephen Hall, he, he designed hinges and I, I think hinges are very important. Not that the mobile phone has hinges, it doesn't, but what bothers me at the, at the, at the mobile phone is too slick. It doesn't have, I, 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 I'm always confused. It's all, it's too sleek. I think you need a, a you need these intermediate uh, pieces, like in this no, case, they, the hinges yeah, so, that you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there are hinges, but they are, uh, they are such that when you close the door, they cover the borders. Uh, it's called L hinges or Z hinges. Uh, that's the, uh, the uh, uh, contemporary concept. And I don't know, I had noticed this since I was in first year of college, though I was studying architecture, I noticed this in furniture. And since then I've tried that we don't show the borders of the box in any of the furniture. Unless you want to deliberately show it, then we make it thick and we emphasize the borders. Otherwise we don't show these uh, slim borders, uh, the structure. <laughs> I'm again, I am on the side of the hinges to be shown. Why to hide them? Imagine, uh, imagine what's all you wear hinge. Uh, it, no, Dan, it's not the hinge. It's the, it's showing the box. Uh, you make it more simple by not showing the, uh, the edges of the box. You make, make the piece of furniture more simple. Uh, it'll just become uh, uh, just four lines. Yeah, well, it's why, a design choice, but... Uh, but why should it be just four lines? This is my question. Because uh, it's that, an, <laughs> an option. It's the way you want to, your furniture to look. Yeah, it's an that, option between true. other options, right? Yeah, it, it's like uh, on the said in, the, in chat. <laughs> it's a design <laughs> option. Very true. Yeah. I, I think it can be beautiful with the hinges and without them. I mean, uh, without them, you, it's more, uh, I don't know, it's more so, sophisticated, more elegant, more, uh, I don't know, more minimalist. And uh, the other option with, like in this one, is more raw, like more, I don't know, industrial where you you show uh, everything uh, of that piece of furniture. Then, but, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, what the about second this thing, one, Vatsal? What is your... Uh, uh, that, then the second thing about that wardrobe was there's a handle in only one of the shutters, so I don't know how they open the second shutter. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I, I'll explain this. What happens is the uh, the right shutter must be two of them together so you open the handle and two shutters they they probably fold uh, and i don't know how they open this i uh, no it's not complicated you open the the one that has a handle and then 
there is another thing that opens the, the, the left one, or, or maybe that one doesn't open. I don't know. Anyway, don't worry. They are Austrians. They knew what they were doing. <laughs> this is without question. They have great craftsmen. Even now in Vienna, you can see, uh, you know, carpenters and people dedicated to manufacturing things in wood, like in, in the old times. I admire this about Vienna. They still have a uh, great culture of, uh, of uh, continuation of, you know, arts and crafts. Another, yes. you know, uh, Adolf Loss uh, uh, piece of furniture. Uh, I, I like them. I, I like these cubes. They are, they are modernistic, they are heavy, they are raw, they are cubes, but they also, I, I don't know, they, they do have a, a certain uh, sophistication still. They, they are not uh, primitive pieces. They, they, they mimic a certain primitiveness, but, but, but they are sophisticated. I don't know about this desk. Uh, but, uh, I imagine it, it, it would be a piece of furniture quite useful for someone who loves to draw or whatever. This is a Theban stool from the Villa Doshnitz. If you remember, it was a villa where he just did uh, the remodeling of the villa. But he also designed this whimsical, this funny little stool uh, with three legs, but the, the legs are uh, a little burlesque, aren't they? Um, anyway, these were designed by um, Adolf Loss. And um, the Grand Hotel, we are approaching the end of the presentation, the Grand Hotel Babylon. It was a competition for Nice. Uh, and um, it was a very large uh, project, I mean, for a very large building. Uh, it was not built is this, uh, you know, a metropolitan in a way uh, kind of hotel, not tall, but quite extended. Uh, and um, it, it would have been nice if it was built, but it, it was not built. Look at the plan, huge, totally huge. Now, I don't know what's going on here. Did he propose this like this or uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it just, it was, it was meant to be Babylon indeed, uh, you know, a hotel of Babylonian dimensions, quite, quite large, not built. Uh, you see here a publication with his, um, with his proposal. The sections are kind of interesting, maybe predictably interesting if, if there is such a thing. The project was from 1923 when, when he was uh, 53 years old. And I don't know what happened, who won it, and maybe it was never built. Uh, so here is the section. He didn't build uh, you know, large public buildings. He built mostly houses, private residences for uh, uh, the bourgeois in the avant-garde artist or the avant-garde in the bourgeois or the, for the bourgeois without anything, uh, without anything uh, relating him or her to the avant-garde and vice versa. Okay, that's it. Now I have, let me, let me, let me see who is here. I have a few other things uh, um, prepared to show you, but uh, I, I would like to take a short break. So uh, we have Vatsal, we have Stefan, we have Ondi, we have Diana, and we have Abi from, uh, from India. We have uh, Abi and we have Vatsal, and then we have from Romania, uh, Diana and Ondi and Jellu and, uh, and myself. So we are seven people here. The, it's a good number. It's the number of the 